After a first intense long day and short night, it felt like our road trip had really started. We had to catch the early bird ferry in Frederikshafen to Gothenburg, Sweden. Time for a rest. We were all exhausted. But our thoughts were still flying. After we listened to the passionate Daniel Kerber about social design and his touching project More Than Shelters, a lot of new perspectives came to our minds. In this case, creating by listening to the individual needs of refugees using design processes to support people to find better solutions within co-creation. As we came closer to Gothenburg, we couldn't wait to see Eric, a social designer from the Kalmas University of Technology. His project idea started in Kenya and was developed further into helping disabled people in third world countries. Together with his friend Christian, he redesigned a wheelchair for their special needs. Let's have a deeper look into their passionate work. Walter, Walter the wheelchair. I'm brought up in Kvevde, a small city 160 kilometers away from Gothenburg. You go northeast. Yeah, I spent my first 19 years there basically. Played football, handball, a bit of ice hockey when I was younger. I always knew that I was going to study engineering because what I was good at was physics and math. And then I kind of thought of Stockholm or Gothenburg, and well, Gothenburg is close enough. I'm a bit of a mama's boy, so wouldn't like to have my family too far away. So that's basically why it was Gothenburg. Perhaps I wouldn't have chosen the exact same path if I would have redone it, because I realized after two months at the university that maths is, is nothing for me. I don't want to have a, a working life where all my days are about calculating and counting. I think I realized quite quickly here that working with people is what I like and what I perhaps do best. I do it better than, than what I do with math and, and physics. But I'm diabetic. So when I started studying, I kind of always were interested in, I have I'm slightly a cyborg. Uh, so I have this insulin pump attached to my body. Uh, and it's quite shitty. These are really, really expensive. This is like 3,000 euros. And it looks like a, a combination between a really old Nokia uh, cell phone and uh, a video game from the mid 80s. Uh, so I quite instantly thought that someone should make those things better. Uh, I didn't know if it was gonna be me, but I kind of, there a kind of interest in, in medical equipment started. So that was perhaps before the social design aspects. Like I, I didn't think that far, it was more like, uh, someone needs to make these products better and why not me? So I studied after my, after graduating my bachelor's, I went to, to the Netherlands and studied in Delft for six months. And I took some courses in Medizyn, called it. Uh, it was anatomy, it was uh, courses in how to design medical equipment, basically. And so when I got back to Sweden, uh, I had a, a wish for doing more projects on the, on the medical side. And then we had this opportunity to go on a course in Kenya. And it felt like I've, I've kind of, I've gotten interested in other cultures. I, I realized I like traveling and I thought that, hey, making a seven week project, university project in Kenya would be a really, really nice experience. And there is perhaps where, where the social design started for real, because I mean, you've, oh, here's the coffee. Everyone's seen uh, what developing countries are like on the news, but it's, it's a completely different story to see it in real life. Uh, 
like the, the slum areas, the shelters. Something, it was a, it was a touching experience, both personally and professionally, but most personally, I mean, it looked exactly like I expected, but the reaction on my, my side was completely different than from what I expected. And for me, that was, that was kind of, that was a big deal for me because every night I tried to write down what I had experienced during that day and I drew silly pictures of it. Uh, and that made me kind of think of not only, okay, today I saw children that didn't have enough to eat or today I saw something, that it made me think about it in a, in a larger perspective. What does it mean? Uh, so I think that constantly having these thoughts rolling in my head made this experience not only a, a, a like physical experience where things happen and it's funny and it's sad and it's it, it made me uh, those reflections were they were important for me. What can we do? What can I do? What if all designers in the world, not only designers, what if all people in the world dared and had the courage to? to make one project each in a developing country. What if it was four weeks, what if it was one week? But it could make a huge difference and I don't know, it was an important part of my life. Like I was about to, I had a, a year left of my university studies, about to graduate, starting to forming who I want to become as a, as a grown up person. And in the middle of that, instead of staying here and getting spoiled, you realize that we're, I don't even know the statistics, but I might be with top 1% in the world, top 2% or 10%, but still, so many people that have, their living circumstances are so much worse than mine. And what did I do to earn that? Nothing. I'm lucky. I mean, I didn't create Sweden. I didn't, I didn't do, I, I didn't do anything to, to earn to stay in a country where we can go to a coffee shop like this, have expensive coffee because we enjoy it. I don't know, but it made me think a lot about, yeah, I mean the, it's so, the world is so not equal and it's not based on what we earn or perform or what we do. Cause I mean, that I had the opportunity to, I. I have a, a master's degree in industrial design engineering and I didn't pay a single penny to do it. And it is because I'm lucky to be born in a country where that system exists. The children born in Kenya, they have just, they have made just as little as I when they are born. But still, they are placed under, in circumstances that are so much worse. So I think it's a responsibility of us that have these opportunities as I do and did to do something. And what's the best way of doing it? I have still no idea. It's also something I've thought about a lot. Is it, is it a good way to, to send money to, to places where, where they don't have it? Is it a good way to go down there? I, I still think it's a better idea to go and try to help. Whatever help means. It can be bringing knowledge, can be trying to do projects, but you, have, you also need to understand that when I come to Kenya, I can't come there and say, hello, I know this, you know, I'm, I come from a university. You have to realize that this is a completely different context. And be humble and understand that now I'm the guest and I have to, I have to try to understand them, but I also have, try to, have to try to figure out what I can do. Because we went down to Kenya with knowledge, which some people there doesn't have. So, I mean, sharing knowledge is is perhaps one of my favorite ways of, of learning and, and teaching. I think that's very important because even though some people have university degrees, some people have worked all their lives, some people are children, some people are men, women or something else, it doesn't matter because I think we all have knowledge we can share with each other and, and grow together as a society. Stroke trophy is something he built himself. It's a, it's a chopped off leg from a, a sofa. And he, he works at an interior design store. And they have these, I don't know, 
Hickman. So it says the worst stroke. Hole 14, I think. But still, won the trophy. The idea was never to make a complete wheelchair. The idea was to make a suggestion on what kind of what kind of requirements do they have here compared to what we have at home and what should the difference be? How should a wheelchair sort of be designed in this context? This is Christian working on one of the earlier prototypes. This is the place where we stayed. I think uh, the prototype has gone a bit further here. And also the, the payment for wheelchair and how people own a wheelchair. It seemed like all the children, they owned their own wheelchairs. And how do you pay for a wheelchair when you're a child? Are you supposed to do that when you're seven years old? And then we started the planning process of who do we actually need for this project to happen? And first of all, it was money. So, I mean, when it comes to the, the social design bit, um, we realized that building something that costs anything, it's already too expensive. Like the, the dream wheelchair would be zero dollars. So you always work against this uh, financial structures and the financial problematics. Being part of competitions like this is part of spreading the project and, and getting interests getting people interested in this kind of development because uh, if you're talking about social entrepreneurs, uh, it's not easy finding people with money that are willing to spend money on a project that doesn't give revenue back. And that's not perhaps social entrepreneurs because those are the people that might do it. But when it comes to normal investors or entrepreneurs, they will probably say, okay, I'll give you this bag of money for 20% of your company and 10 years later, they, they get revenue back. But in this case, we're not completely sure how that financial structure looks because we didn't make this project to earn money. It was an attempt to develop the wheelchairs in these parts of the world and to make the wheelchairs better. There is one moment that is very, very strong, but I realized it's not the only moment, but it was, we, we went to a guy who was a double amputee he had a, an accident with, I cannot remember if it was a train or a bus, but he was, he was hit and run over and he lost both his legs. And uh, they, he was put in a wheelchair and uh, they have now built a ramp outside of his home. It's about perhaps 40 or 50 centimeters high, two steps to get into the house. And now they built a concrete ramp instead and he cannot, he cannot ride up that ramp in his wheelchair. So what he does is, climbs out of the chair, crawls up the stairs, and then pulls the chair behind him, jumps back into the chair and rolls into his house. So in his own wheelchair, he's not able to go into his own house. When he tried our prototype, for the first time in his life, he could sit in a wheelchair and ride into his own house. And that was a, that experience was so amazing. And I, I remember shouting to Christian, this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted to show that it's possible to give people more uh, mobility in if you just put more effort into the actual product so that was those kind of moments and when I analyzed the material I realized that we met more people like that that were able to overcome obstacles in their everyday environments in our chair that they had never been able to manage before not only thanks to the product because you should not you have to consider that these people they're usually living outside of cities in on the countryside and they rarely meet other people in wheelchairs. So just seeing someone pushing you, saying, okay, if I can do it, I started riding wheelchairs a couple of months ago, then you can do it. And they try and they try again and they are able to do it. But I think that those moments when you realize, if I can come out with, in this case, my own equipment or someone else's equipment and teach people and make them learn how to overcome obstacles to make themselves more independent. That's, for me, that's huge. I mean, I can't sacrifice all my life. It's if, if it's impossible to live out of it, like I need, I need enough money to at least pay for my own food also. But I don't really need more than that. So if I can invest my time and my knowledge in projects like this and still have a decent life, I mean, if I can eat and sleep, that's enough for me and that'd give me so much more if I could uh, if I could provide something back. <laughs>